Hello everyone, welcome to a very special episode of Greedy Keeps. Today we have the wonderful Ben. Uh, ben, how do you go online? I, I don't even know. I, I usually just go by my name, Ben Loeb, or okay. Ben Z Loeb, that's my middle initial. All right, so uh, the reason we have Ben on today is we're discussing, I guess like four color control, I don't know, do you call it curious control still? I, I, I call don't... it curious control or four color rash me, either one. All right. So it's a four colors, uh, sans white control deck that uses Thrasios and Vile Smasher, and you're trying to just like control the board. And we're going to be going over some mulligans, some deck philosophy, and maybe some strategy uh, with the deck over the next episode of Good Keeps during this, this this video. Um, do you have any initial thoughts on the deck or anything you want to say before we get started? Um, I wanted to say that this is a very unusual archetype in terms of control. Most people are trying to be very proactive or maybe a little bit slower. Here we're playing into a much later game, and a lot of our philosophy is going to reflect that. We're not trying to win early. We can, but we're not trying to. So it's not like a mid-range deck where like sometimes you just have those hands where you go like turn one Noble Hire, turn two Thassa's Oracle Consult. You don't really do yeah. that very often. Honestly, if I keep a slow hand, it means that I have Thassa's Oracle and Consult in hand. <laughs> okay. All right. So do you, do you have any mulligan philosophy? Like how do you typically uh, look for a good hand? So I have a very specific mulligan philosophy, and it starts with a 60-card format. First, there was the Vancouver mulligan, and every, it, pros said that people don't mulligan enough. And then they changed the mulligan system, and the beca mulligans became so much better. So you should be mulliganing even more. Then you move into to Commander, where you get a free mulligan. Mulligan even more! And then you, well, you also get to draw on your first turn, regardless of where you're sitting at the table. Mulligan more. I go to five pretty often. Yeah, I, I think this is something that you and I, like, in our, I, for people, I don't know if I mentioned it already, but uh, Ben and I play in a paper play group pretty often. And, you know, after a gaming or during a game or during the mulligans, people usually like, you know, are having discussions about the format. I think this is something that you and I uh, both agree on pretty strongly. Uh, the name of the series is Greedy Keeps. You're supposed to be really greedy. And uh, since you've developed this deck, or you've put a lot of work into it, I'm sure uh, you're definitely paid off for that. <laughs> so Yeah, mulliganing is great. It's a... You have the chance to mulligan. It's not something that you only do when you need to. It is an opportunity. Yeah, it's it's like it's like an aspect of the game where you get to roll the dice, and the odds are rigged. You know, yeah. Like it, you get to you get to choose what cards are in your deck, and then you also get to, to mulligan for free. It's like, why wouldn't I mulligan? You know, this hand's just okay. I have an option. Your sixes and a six and seven are both like free. Like the cost of going to six is not as it's not that high. So you basically get three free hands. You know, I, I take it. <laughs> Agreed. Honestly, when I when I mulligan, I remind myself that the land uh, a hand of lands, crypt, and then either Ristic or Remora is better than most sevens. <laughs> Yeah, I, I remember, I think it's, I was watching uh, Rebel play her Sisse deck, and I was watching the games as she, like, molded to, like, three or four, and I was like, oh, yeah, like, some decks you just don't even need cards in hand. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> you know, if she gets, like, a Mana Vault and a Soul Ring and a Land, that's, like, that's a turn three win. <laughs> so this deck obviously isn't like that, but... You know, it, every deck's going to mulligan differently, and most decks can probably mulligan quite aggressively in this format. Agreed. All right, so uh, speaking of mulliganing aggressively, let's go to our first hand. So right here we have Ghostly Pilfer, Sig Rither, Riffer Cutthroat, Assassin's Trophy, Chain of Vapor, Notion Thief, Taiga, Bloom Tender. Obviously, uh, a one lander is pretty, pretty tough, <laughs> so I think we can comfortably throw this one away. Yeah. Okay. Now we have a Assassin's Trophy, Vampire Tutor, Cataxian Probe, Keen Sense, Nature's Claim, Overgrown Tomb, Mana Crypt. Um, there's some notable things here. I think specifically the fact that you can Cataxian Probe and Vampire Tutor on turn one, and you have the Mana Crypt. I'm not sure like what that actually leads you into, but it's definitely uh, important to consider. 
I actually worry much more about the ramp than what cards I have in hand otherwise. I mean, if you look at that Keen Sense, that's going to represent a really good card advantage engine on uh, Val Smasher. Uh, so I love the play here of just uh, a Shock and Overgrown Tomb Vamp for Arcane Signet if you want. Uh, 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 get Probe to get the uh, Arcane Signet, cast Mana Crypt, cast Arcane Signet. Like, that just seems great. You have so much mana on the board. It yeah. doesn't matter what's happening this turn. You can just cast a, a Violet Smasher and set up Keen Sense on the next turn and get an attack and then start drawing. Yeah, and even even better, if you hit a land off the top two, it doesn't... I mean, it has to tap for green or red, right? I think that's the way it ends up working. It just has... Yeah, it has to tap for green or red. So... Or it, black. Yeah, or yeah. So basically, if you draw a land next turn, <laughs> if you draw a land next turn, and then the first two draws because you don't actually lose a draw because the vampire tutor and the Gitaxian pro, you know, little combo. If you draw a land off the off the top two cards of your deck on turn two, you can just play Vial Smasher and Keen Sense, and then now you have like the the card advantage engine that the deck is sort of built around. So that, that's a pretty good way to start out the game, I'd say. Yeah, this this hand is very good. Like even though. It might seem that this hand doesn't have a really good use for the mana from Mana Crypt. You see that it actually gives us so much speed here, just casting that Arcane Signal on turn one. It's so much, it's so worth it. Well, getting to Sol Ring and Crypt is great. Yeah, and I will say, like, if you think of, uh, if you look at Gitaxian Probe and Vampire Tutor, it's sort of like going to six, but you get to choose a card in your hand. And like that's Absolutely. probably a that's probably a good trade off, right? I think we can all agree if we could if we could pick one of the cards in our six, we would probably keep a lot of sixes. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, you know, I, this seems to be a, a pretty powerful hand. I, I could totally keep. I would totally keep it. Well, yeah. I don't know if I would totally keep it. I am a little spooked by the one lander in a control deck, but the mana crypt plus the arcane signet that this uh, vampire tutor and Gitaxian probe represent is uh, is really powerful. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're going to have four man on turn one guaranteed, and we have two draws at uh, another lands on turn two, so I'm I'm fully comfortable keeping this hand. Yeah, that makes sense. All right, let's go to our uh, our new first seven. Chrome Mox, Wooded Foothills, Vexing Shusher, Carpet of Flowers, Spell Snare, Foster Storm, Red Elemental Blast. This hand has some mana. I, I wouldn't say it's filled with mana, but it has, it has access to it, but it's incredibly interactive and has some of the best counter spells in the format right now. Um, I think Spell Snare is a little restrictive, but often if you look at like the games that you're actually playing, like people are playing two mana spells that win the game, and so Spell Snare is like a really powerful one mana counter spell. Like if you look at Corvold, for example, I mean that's the deck that pops into my mind immediately. There are so many games where I play the Dockside into one mana interaction being held up, and my opponents just like die. With with a Spell Snare, like you can you can hold up that one mana. In a few way. of the one mana counters or maybe none of them hit uh dockside i mean no, looking it's spell at them snare. It's, it's literally it's... spell snare yeah after that you'd be on something crazy like blue blast um so <laughs> which i wish was playable uh spell snare is a, a meta call uh it is just because it hits several of the most powerful cards in this format right now, which is Dockside, Underworld Breach, uh, and Thassa's Oracle slash Tainted Pact. So hitting all of those is just so worth it. I think the card's really, really powerful now, and it has not disappointed me once since I have put yeah. it in the deck. And I feel like, although it's not great against the... It's not, like... It's not great as a protective spell, if you think of it. So that's, like, why a lot of decks, I feel like, can't really run it, is because, like, it doesn't actually protect... It doesn't protect you. It's like a hoser almost. But in this deck, you're, you're, those are how you're actually using your counter spells. You're trying to like surgically, you know, prevent people from from winning the game, and that's how you have to use counter spells in this format. And I feel like spell snare gets the job done a surprisingly high amount of the time. This Agreed. is a card. This is a card that a lot of people for a long, you know, I sound, but a lot of people for a long time, myself included, have been like waiting for this card to get good enough as like the two drop slot just keeps getting more and more competitive and so we're definitely getting close to it just being agreed like nuts all right are we keeping this hand though um so this hand the problem is it doesn't have card advantage w am i willing to keep it so this is our first seven mm -hmm. what does this hand do 
It's if someone no. plays an island on turn one, we can Chromox picks pitch Vex, Vexing Shusher, go carpet into uh, 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 second main phase, crack the land, get Thrasios out. So that's like not terrible, but I'm not excited by this. This is a first seven. I'm I'm very aggressive. Let's get a good hand. This is I an agree. okay hand, but I want a good hand. I agree. I think the fact that you can't activate Thrasios on turn two is like part of the deciding factor for me. Like, a turn with Thrasios is great, but if you can't activate it on turn two, you might as well have played on turn two. They're about as useful. So, I, I think you throw this one away. Reap, Bayou, Volcanic Island, Underground River, Noxious Survival, Carpet of Flowers, Curiosity. So, we have the Curiosity, you know, combo uh, in our hand. It's not really a combo as much as the card advantage engine. But we do have some acceleration in the form of a Carpet of Flowers, and Noxious Survival is sometimes an interaction i we wouldn't want to lean on it which this hand does but it, it can do that it's not very useful here as a regrowth so that's how i look at the hand how do you see it so we have carpet again so that again makes the position on our table pretty uh, important um i really am looking for a fast hand so carpet maybe fills that role it's not great it's we're really depending on it. If it gets misstepped, we're, we're dead in the water. I think we, we do I mean, have noxious, noxious survival. Yeah. We could noxious survival back, so I, I take it back a little bit. But again, this is our seven. I'm really aggressive. Let's just keep sure. mulling, in my opinion. All right, uh, this one is close for me. I think if we could trade like a land for like a, maybe a, I don't know if you're like a miscast. Maybe I don't know if you're on that, but I think no, like a no. land for a miscast would be would be kind of nice. Yeah, it's awkward having the reap and the noxious survival because early game those are worse so I, I feel like we're almost on a five card hands the carpet and the curiosity means that we have some ramp and some card advantage which is pretty appealing but i still just want something a little bit faster i'm i just aggressively mold this one's reasonable to keep but i'm gonna be more aggressive sure all right let's go to six fire covenant breeding pool overgrown to mana drain badlands dark ritual fiery islet um this one seems to be lacking also as a six it does you know i think you throw away the overgrown tomb probably that's where i'm leaning um, uh i agree uh so fire covenant is just a card i absolutely love it's so powerful in terms of a tempo play just knocking everyone back down to to, to square one uh, that said, this hand doesn't do much, so and doesn't have the fast mana that I'm looking for. So I'm I'm fine with going to five. I go to five often, and if you lose to Mulliganing, that's okay with me. Counterspell, Talisman, Marsh Blast, Mystical Tutor, Forest, Flood is Strand, Keen Sense. So you have your card advantage engine. You have a Counterspell. Uh, sadly, you can't really hold up your Counterspell unless you choose to not play your Talisman, which kind of sucks. The Mystical Tutor. I, what do you usually get here with a Mystical Tutor? I'd say here, I'm not particularly looking for an interactive spell because we're in five cards where we're for perfectly comfortable leaning on the rest of the table to interact with each other to some extent. So I want to be getting some card advantage. Uh, I think that a decent choice is Brainstorm if you want to just do something like that. Uh, but ultimately, I think I'd actually just hold it and uh, tutors get better the longer you wait because things develop you might learn what you need what do you think of like i don't know if this works out but can you go like a t turn one mystical tutor for dark ritual you dark ritual into the talisman plus foul smasher turn three keen sense hold up counter spell is that is um, that possible thank turn one turn two we do have fetches so that we can get the colored mana uh, I we can't cast the keen sense until turn three. Yeah, because we won't have green mana. Yeah, but like that's a good play. I, I do. I don't. I don't mind that at all. Um, yeah, dark ritual is really in here just to power out the rocks. Uh, yeah. I, I, I'm if late game you could turn two mana into a Thrasios activation by casting dark rit. That's really what it's there for at the end game um or I, maybe you need more interaction and somehow black mana will help you with that i'm not sure how uh yeah 
One thing but, I will say though is that because of the way this hand is, you have to put two at the bottom, and so that play like basically uses every card in your hand. Yeah, I was thinking about that as well. Um, there's a decent chance I put Mystical Tutor on the bottom just because uh, we need we need card we need cardboard in our hand. That's literally it. So uh, we have to like if we're keeping this, we have to put two cards on the bottom, and. It's it is probably Forest it's... and Mystical Tutor. I want to say it's those two. I feel, yeah, I think I feel comfortable with putting those two in the bottom. Okay. What do you think? I think, I think I'd put Counterspell and Forest on the bottom. I could definitely see that as well. Forest is definitely the one on the bottom, and then either Mystical or Counterspell, I think that that depends on the table to some extent. Um, Counterspell's two mana. Holding up two mana is probably not something that we're going to do for a while. Um, I also don't mind just going like turn one, uh, like land, turn two, uh, Talisman, hold up Mystical Tutor, and as that next turn passes, you can learn what you need to tutor for. Yeah, you get like a fire, a fiery confluence or something like that. Oh man, fire! Yeah, fire covenant. That would be sick. Oh, fire covenant. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. All right. So that's the five. Uh, not entirely sure. What, I don't think there's a, we're in total agreement on what we do here, but you know, just interesting. A lot of a lot of choices depending on the table and where you want to take the deck. All right, let's go look at a uh, first seven. Bayou Veil of Summer, Demonic Consultation, Curiosity, Felwar Stone, Seedborn Muse, Jace Wielder of Mysteries. This is an interesting one. Do you it's our consult first seven. for Mana Crypt? That's my question. <laughs> I did yesterday on turn one. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's uh, the problem with that is that um, that consult looks pretty nice next to the Jace. Yeah. Uh, that said, this hand doesn't do anything until... It, like, we need a second mana. And yeah. you I think I think if you keep this, you do... You have to, like... You have to do that, I think, if you keep this I hand. I agree. But I don't think you keep this hand as a first seven. I 100% agree with that. If I'm keeping this hand, I'm definitely making that play. That said, I'm not keeping this hand. Yeah. All right. Thassa's Oracle, Badlands, Notion Thief, Drown on the Law, Training Ground, Sig, Talisman. I, this is a one lander with no acceleration. I think we just got to throw it away. Agreed. Brainstorm, Exotic, Orchard, Forbidden Orchard, Veil of Summer, Underground Sea, Vexing Shusher, Felwar Stone. This one's pretty awkward, too. This is our six. Yeah, it's our six. I really do, do love me some Mana Crypt Soul Ring action, and just to power out the two mana rocks. So I'm kind of tempted to throw this a one away. Brainstorm's pretty powerful. We don't have a shuffle effect, though. Yeah, I think that's like the biggest I think I could just be greedy and just throw it back. We can go for five. All right. I'm looking to five often. I said that, and it's still Keen's, true. Keen Sense, Preordain, Brainstorm, Sylvan Library, Toxic Deluge, Dark Ritual, City of Rest. I actually really like this hand. Me too. Um, I like it more than some of, several of the hands we've seen. Um, so that proves that mulling to five like yeah. isn't always bad. You have a lot of options here too. Like you can keep the Cantrip heavy hand. You can keep the uh, the Deluge hand. You like. A hand that's kind of dependent on like you know hitting a land drop, but can always just dark ritual out a deluge if it has to. Um, I think I mean as far as what we're putting on the bottom, uh, obviously not the lands. I think we definitely want to keep the Sylvan Library. That's looking really nice. Uh, the cantrips look great. Uh, I think if the table is very creature heavy, you could keep dark Rite and toxic deluge. Um, I don't know. This hand has so many options. It's really hard to say. I think what I would do is I'd throw away the Dark Ritual and the Deluge. And then I think what the plan... I might, you know, I might even throw away the Toxic Deluge in the Keen Sense. I'm not entirely sure. But I do like the I do like playing Priority on turn one, digging for a land. If I don't hit the land, then I can always brainstorm into a land. And it's like, what are the chances there isn't a, a land on the top seven? Cantrips um, are so strong. I, I like that play. Um, Keen Sense is going to take a while to put online. We need... Uh, it's, I mean, it's ultimately four mana. You're casting Keen Sense and Vile Smasher. So I'm comfortable with putting that one away and Deluge as well. So I, or, or Dark Ritual, any of any two of those three cards, I think, to some yeah. extent. One of the appeals of the Dark Ritual is that it can always just kind of like 
cycle into your Thrasios, or it can help like force out a rock if you end up just hitting like two rocks off your brainstorm or something. Yeah, that's why I'm a little tempted to keep it. Yeah, I think Daily Even though that looks weird. I think Daily and Keen Sense are are fine picks. Yeah. That's all right. And I'm comfortable with this five. We can hopefully just uh, preordain into a land and then slam Sylvan Library on two. I'm fine with that. Yeah. Yeah. Let's uh let's go down. Back up. Uh, sorry. Back up to seven. Mana Confluence, Counterspell, Sig, Preordain, Talisman, Fierce Guardianship, Flusterstorm. So we're getting hit with a lot of lands where there's like no fetch lands. And it's just like the worst lands in our deck or worth one landers. It's kind of rough. It happens. I will say though, like you can just keep the hand on the back of like Preordain and Sig almost. Yeah, Preordain, um, Sig, Fierce Guardian, Flusterstorm. Those are all great cards, and we have Talisman, so we can ramp a little bit. Um, this hand's kind of nice. But as a first seven, I'm just going to be way greedy. There's no reason to... I think sure. that I would never keep this on my first seven. Maybe I'd think about it on my second seven. Scalding Tarn, Abrupt Decay, Ponder, Overgrown Tomb, Exotic Orchard, Sylvan Library, Pluto Delta. Um, this one's actually not horrible. I think it's like super likely that if you just go like Ponder into Sylvan Library, you'll hit like a ton of interaction and just be able to start grinding out the game. Agreed. Um, it's nice to see more than one land in our hand for once. Yeah. Uh, Ponder into Sylvan Library is great. Uh, we're l lacking a little bit of uh, speed, but here I think that Sylvan Library on turn two is just so powerful. Yeah, I mean, I I prefer to play it on turn one. That's like when I played, <laughs> medium, when I played medium green, like those are the hands I kept where like with, with, with Library, it was often like on the back of the library, I mean, it's like by turn two, I was already digging, and that deck played a lot of like, you know, free, free mana. I'm sure this deck does too. But I, I, you know, that's that's what I like to have. But you know, a turn two library is still good enough. I do have one question for you that I, I've noticed from a lot of these hands. Like on turn two, you seem to like be kind of like putting out your value engines a lot of the time. Have you like struggled lately with that? Because like I played a game that I played. I think I played six games with spleen the other night of uh from the into the north podcast and he went on turn two five out of those six games and it's like and the pod was very um was not blue heavy he was the only blue deck i'd say like four out of those games and so like maybe you just being there makes that happen less like you're you're just your presence at the table makes that happen less but that is something like as I when I was building Neo Four mid range to kind of be more adapted to the current meta. That was something I thought about a lot. Was like turn two having a Thrasios playing Thrasios and then holding up like a miscast or something. Do you is is your meta game like that? Like are you finding that a lot of games on turn two you just have to have like a Fluster Storm or a miscast up? I want to make it clear that this deck is not great into three uh, fast combo decks. You're you're not favored there. That said. What you need to do is bully the other decks into trying to defend, uh, to to elongate the game just a little bit. So, it's perfectly fine to pass priority when you have an answer. If, when you use that answer, the next person is just going to win on their turn. You're going to need to rely on other people in the table. You're trying to only use your interaction to stop someone from winning when there's no other option, or if you're really ahead, you can start to slash the other people who uh, have card advantage in play. Yeah, I when I played Paco, which is like you know obviously you have access to black, but I feel like uh, these like the team or color combination, I feel like you tend to have a lot of the similar uh, play play styles. I think when you're not on like Turbo Nas, uh, I found that I was in a very similar position where a lot of the time I was just trying to use my free counter spells to kind of like bully the other players into having to use an interaction and then like if they didn't have it i'd be like oh okay here's my force of negation um by tapping out for value engines really early like paco and holm so i definitely can like see where you're coming from with that i personally i i i'm avoiding decks like this right now because i think so many of my pods are turbo nos decks and i have a lot of fun playing them right now so that also helps i know this is a deck you really enjoy playing i also think when you play a deck like this it forces the turbo Nas decks to have to change how they play uh which over time can be beneficial to you um i will say that uh you are my meta 
there are a few non-blue decks. There are Turbonaz decks, but they are usually blue, so they have some answers to each other. Uh, I'm trying to think how many decks in my meta don't play blue. I don't know, blue's pretty great. <laughs> I, I've been playing Corvo lately, and uh, I have a lot of my friends who are building it, so I gotta figure, I gotta start pick playing blue again, because I'm like, I can't have triple Corvold pods, or like, you know, Mad Farm and Corvold, and then there's like, you know, just Food Chain and Kima, and they're just like, Food Chain, play Food Chain, counter your removal spell, I win. So Yeah, it's tough. Um, I do think that one thing that really helped the stack recently was the printing of uh, Fierce Guardianship and Deflecting Swat. Being able to tap out for Thrasios and have interaction up is huge. It's been yeah. really, really good for the deck. Yeah, I I agree. I think I think Deflecting Swat is like one of the most impactful cards from the from like the new, this year. I think in general, if you look at the most impactful cards of the year, they all are either Thassa's Oracle or Red. <laughs> um, they're all Red cards in Thassa's Oracle, and obviously this deck stands to benefit from that because it is a it is a console deck that is Red. So. Are you on Breach, by the way? Are you using that as like a value engine, or I'm using it as a value engine and not a combo piece. That's fine. I think, I think people really underrate it there. I, I, I feel like Unruled Breach is just a regrowth, and that's fine. I mean, you're, you're on Reap, so obviously yeah. regrowth is like not a bad card, although that's an instant, which is insane. Yeah, regrowth is uh, or Reap is a fun card because Reap. Uh, regrowth of there's an instant speed is usually the deal you're getting, and that's a good deal. But as soon as you get more than one card, you feel like you're playing the best card in the you're magic. Cheating. You're, you're cheating. You're cheating. <laughs> when you get a when you get a force of will and a blue card, it's like, <laughs> who let me get away with this? You get consults back and a counter spell. Oh my god, I've done that. That's that's really fun. I've 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 done plays where I end step consult for Thassa's Oracle and then reap back the consult, untap Thassa's Oracle consult. That's sick. I mean, I could even see a play where you do something like uh, consult for reap, reap back uh, demonic consultation and taint impact or something like that. Um, something ridiculous like that. It, so. it, that would be a good play, or could be a good play if um, reap gets more than one card. Yeah, like you just get value. <laughs> Yeah, they're uh, Reap's an insane magic card. So uh, you're also on Compost, another powerful hate card that is not underplayed, but definitely stands to. It's definitely better than it was maybe seven months ago, right? Like, yeah. Um, one of the major things with this deck is that you get to play a ton of card advantage engines, and you get to choose what they are. So if Compost's not good in your meta, you can play Verity Circle. If Verity Circle is not good in your meta, you can play Ghostly Pilfer. There are so many slots that you can do whatever you want with in this deck, and I think that that's one of the things that I enjoy the most with it. Yeah. I will say, I think this deck is is like a challenge. Like, I think you, I think you have spent so much time playing decks like this that you're at a pretty huge advantage. Like... I don't know. I know. I don't know what your record is on play DH. I know that you play there pretty pretty often at one point, and I remember you telling me your record. And I was like, "That's better than that deck deserves." <laughs> um, and it's not because the deck's bad. It's just like your record was insane. <laughs> yeah, my so. record was about fifty percent in like eighty games, That's which insane. was pretty good. I was very happy with that. I did yeah. realize that some of that data was skewed because I was often playing with another friend who's playing another reactive deck. So I think that once there's a second reactive deck at the table, your win percentage skyrockets so high. Oh, yeah. You're just I, so favored. I, yeah, I agree. I mean, medium green was like that. So like uh, Anno, uh, Anonymous or something like that is uh, writing a, a, like a primer for CST and TNT and all the, all the TNT decks. And he was asking me like about some quote he had that was effectively like medium green is trying to take advantage of the mid range decks of the format. And I was like, what you should say is medium green is trying to take advantage of the mid range aspect of the format where at, for a time, the entire format was mid rangey. And so you were not, it wasn't parasitic really. It's not parasitic if the entire format is defined by some, by mid range. Today, I don't think that's the case, and so I wouldn't play a deck like Medium Green. And I probably wouldn't play a deck like this, to be honest, I, for the same reasons. However, I think it is a deck, and I think a lot of decks are like this, that is, is definitely benefited by you just 
you know, brute forcing just dozens and dozens and dozens of games and like figuring out how to, you know, sneak wins in under people, you know, or over people in the case of this deck. Yeah, it's interesting. I have a lot of experience in control in a number of formats, modern, pioneer, more modern, a lot of modern, and some popper. Um, and it's... I'm already very used to uh, evaluating how dangerous a threat is and how to use my life total as a resource and uh, trying to maximize card advantage at every point you can while minimizing risk, all kinds of balancing, all those kinds of things. Uh, but what's interesting is once you get to CDH, a lot of that changes, especially because interaction is now card, advantage, uh, card disadvantage. Mm -hmm. Because if player A uses interaction with player B, player C and D didn't use up a card, so now they're up a card. Um, so it means that you have to be much more reluctant on uh, interaction. Uh, that said, we're still playing a ton of it because we don't want to lose. So yeah. to make up for that, now we're playing a ton of card advantage, and uh, you, can only, you can be much more free with your interaction once you have a lot of card advantage in play. And so every turn, when you have card advantage, you want to just drop another card advantage engine and hold up interaction. That's the goal of this deck. Just drop card advantage engine after card advantage engine. Yeah. I remember I was talking to, uh, this is on Twitter the other day, or it might have been today, is uh, Charles was talking about how Charles is a mono-white Heliod player, but he plays the old Heliod, not the new Heliod. So he doesn't even play combo. He doesn't play any combos in his deck. And he might have, like... A rule of law combo in there i honestly don't know but i don't think he does i think he literally just wins with heliod beats and he was saying that cdh players in general are not skillful at winning those grindy like advantage games where you're forced to like determine like if <laughs> very simple combat math I, I played a game a few i played a game on rebels uh, youtube channel where it, it was a paco deck and a a opus thief opus a free thieves lift list and i was on um medium green you know for mid-range and i realized you know pretty early in the game that everyone's win conditions have been exiled by like a rest in peace plus a wheel and i was just going to have to win with dorks and so for the rest of the game i was attacking with my dorks you know and, and i had do i was doing the math every turn like how many dorks can i throw into this paco and halden and still like get in at one point i vampire tutored for our favor elder because I was like, oh, the Favor Elder can get through the Halden, so I'm going to stop bleeding as many dorks, you know, stuff like that. And I, it's really fun when it does come up, it doesn't come up very often. But that's where a lot of CEDH players are not as, you know, practiced. Where if you've played a deck like this, like you and I have, you learn a lot of things like that, where you're like, everyone is completely stalled out, I have a card advantage engine, and these like two, three creatures in play, they're just going to have to get there, you know? Yeah, it reminds me of games I've played where my both Jace and Thassa's Oracle were in exile, and at the time I was not on Mnemonic Betrayal, so I just didn't have a way of winning. So it just came down to beats and Vile Smasher triggers, and I just murdered everyone. Yeah, I mean, I've been there with Timna and Faber Elder especially. Um, you know, sometimes you just have to do it, and the cool thing about the OG Heliod is that it makes it makes three one three two creatures with Vigilance, so like... It's insane in that game, and that's why Charles plays it. And so it's interesting to see the format doesn't really lend itself to decks like this right now, but you know, I, I see people starting to play tons of stacks, and whenever people start playing stacks, you know, the mid-range decks can be like, hey, I got under the stacks, or hey, I, went, I go over the stacks, and that's like where a lot of these decks want to hang out, is in pods where there's a stacks deck, maybe two turbo decks, and like a control deck. And then like you can really start, you know, being greedy with the control because you know your opponents are having to interact with these stacks pieces or they lose and you don't care because your sylvan library is in play and you're just going to draw a whole bunch of cards so yeah it's I, you know I, I hope these decks become good again i think they will i i used to not think that but i think people are getting better with stacks as time goes on and i think that's what just has to happen for the meta to kind of go back to that spot you know i think uh, often the meta needs just to settle to some extent for stacks to be able to focus on what it needs to beat, and then you can get stacks into a, a good place. Um, and then once that stacks deck gets good, these control decks get even better because I'm perfectly comfortable playing into a Rule of Law or Deafening Silence because I, most of the spells that I cast, I don't actually care if they resolve. I'm just trying to wear out people's resources and draw cards. Yeah, exactly, which the stacks deck is also trying to do often, but That's true. they have to play worse cards usually. You know, like 
so so that's like a, a push and pull and it's really interesting because like i feel like we've the stack stacks have, have settled i think we're at that point right now in the meta where the stack stacks have settled and we're starting to see like counterplay to the stack stacks uh there's some brewing going on right now with like oh, uh, with a uh, knowledge pool which i'm just like <laughs> amazed by i don't know if you've seen that online but there's like if you uh, have yeah, with a rule Lavinia. of law yeah well if you have a rule of law in play and you play a, a knowledge pool the game ends that's it yeah no one can play spells anymore so like if you if you're if you're a stack deck you're, and your opponent plays a knowledge pool you can't put your rule of law effects into it which is just so weird so there's start i i'm really excited to see where that goes i'm excited to see where the stack decks go with the gnaws I'm excited to see what Commander Legends brings to see if maybe the format just gets even more broken. So, agreed. All right, All right. I I got to go to work. I'm running late already, Ben. <laughs> Do you have uh, anything you want to say to people before we uh, we close this up? Um, uh, I'd like to say, um, I'd love to see all these re reactive decks uh, get better in the matter. They're super fun. It's the kind of magic I love the most. I love magic so much. I just want to keep playing the same game. And that's why I make these games last longer. Yeah. And, uh... <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I was, as I was getting beat five, Oh, almost six. Oh, against spleen the other night, I was thinking, oh, I should pull out medium green. So, you know, <laughs> uh, maybe we'll get there eventually. I don't know. We'll, it'll, we'll have to see. <laughs> All right. Have a nice day. Have a nice you day, too. Ben. Have a nice day, everyone who's watching this. I hope you all enjoyed the content. I hope you all enjoyed hearing from the uh, the control master himself, Ben. So thank you. Have a nice one. Bye. Bye.